obviously with you a few times, but I've worked a lot of leagues with you. We um, actually went the longest time not casting yeah, 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 yeah. together. We yeah. were kind of like the cursed duo that never really yeah. got lined up. But every league I would go to, so when I was in the UKIN, when I uh, helped in Nordics or Benelux, the co-cast would always be like, oh, have you, oh, Oregon, oh, Des. Yeah, have you heard about Des in Oregon? Oh, he's always like, Snurrelief was like, oh, you're not here, but we're getting like three Oregons because Des isn't <laughs> here. And so, you know, I've never actually had the pleasure of seeing your excitement um, on this map in progress. Yeah, excitement, probably a, a strong word, but a, <laughs> a keen intensity towards it. Yeah. A, a like for, mm -hmm. I don't know. It is exciting to watch for many reasons that we'll go to as the game progresses, no doubt. But let's get through these bands first and foremost. Cloud9 taking away Capital and Goyo. No big surprise. Often see the Goyo use for the stall tactics downstairs inside a blue bunker. Hold on to Elbow or L, as some teams in NA call it. Burn it out as the aggressors try to come into blue bunker. Pull your way back into sight. Reinforce the supply wall. Also going to see where my taken away here. So that's becoming a much more staple band for a lot of teams around the world. Because it does break open the the requirement to one bring so many flashbangs and two to spend so much of the round dealing with all of this anti grenade utility. So although it doesn't necessarily break the utility meta, it does lessen it somewhat. It gives you the kind of more prototype version of it rather than the fully fledged one that we see in a lot of games these days. Starting off on the laundry hold, and obviously if you look towards the Capital ban, this was something that we saw the other day. I think it was in the APAC South finals where we played around this map and Capital wasn't banned and he was barely played. And I think for me, it's just, this is kind of a good example. You know, for a lot of other regions, he's an instant ban. He's so good on this map. You look at how uh, Cloud9 were playing quite heavily around utility, around smokes as well. For them to remove him and make that job a little bit tougher for their opponents, it swings into the possibility of, well, we're very confident doing it. Obviously, Giants starting on the defense and starting deep. They have the mirror and they have the capabilities of Kai eating all the hatches they need to. You look at the slight limitations to hard destruction, but it's a double job here in the hands of C9. Mirror could be really interesting here based on where she sets up. A number of teams this week, this wall that Hysterix has now just ran to and started reinforcing or was about to reinforce and then changed his mind. Okay, no, he just had a slight map lapse in his attention span. Now gone back to the wall and started reinforcing it. I think that is actually a really good wall to go for a reinforce on because you can keep a very close eye not only on the stairs to the north, but also slightly to the right towards Electric. And you can see a couple of re uh, reinforcements coming in there just to block the angles from the stairs through into the back corner of sight. It just gives the attackers less of an option, less of the focus on that wall that I was talking about a second ago where we've seen repeated breaches coming through this week. You are going to see the Thermite coming out along with the Habana, so lots of options for the destruction from above or laterally at the same time. And it just screams to me that that focus must come in from the north side. Envy Taylor is looking towards, obviously, pushing towards the opposite small tower as they wait for some aggression here from within blue. Nothing instantly. And Sweet Black's just going to pull away. We obviously saw the aggression there dance with again. If I'm going to reference the other finals, very silly clash plays going on underneath. And to be honest, both these teams are very comfortable mm. bringing clash as we've seen before. Quick spray, doesn't catch anybody, and it's just slow setting up, making sure everything is in the positions they need it to be. The roam game from the hand of Hysterics could be the big problem. Takes one drone, looks towards the second, but Nova's just going to feed that intel. Now get dropped, but here is the cover, and they know very much where Hysterics is. You can see a body on the other side of Showers, too, which oh, is going to be... very good. Yeah, who locks it off. Envy Taylor had the other side, had the cover, had the watch, and had Hysterics. It's a problem when you're roaming by yourself like this with very limited options. Playing out towards dining, you've got Freezer to run down. So what do you do? You stick someone on the white stairs window. You have someone pushing from kitchen. You can even come in via small tower if you want to. But that was a perfect pinch coming out of the side of Cloud9. It has waited about a minute, mind you. So now we're starting to look towards the site and where the focus is going to come in. You can hear the hatch inside of Electric being opened up. And I'm wondering now where the rest of the team are going to push from. A couple hanging out towards construction. One in Big Tower. As said earlier on, it looks like it is going to be a big focus coming in towards the north side of the sites. Sayel has got all the way down to the pillar. There's a man coming in behind them too. They want to apply this instant pressure here and they've otherwise had to pull away. Speakeasy escapes with their life, but probably most importantly, the three very, uh, very hefty smoke canisters that can completely control any of the immediacy that the push intends to have. There goes a charge, there goes a charge, <laughs> and there goes another one placed by Nova. 
That is now Blue Bunker opened up to Envy Taylor's close. And Jordan is going to go for a swing with a shotgun, but didn't know that Envy Taylor was just a little bit too oh, far. Envy. And it doesn't matter how far they are from Envy Taylor. Get Speak easy third for the round and looks to light up on this Whoa. opening. Sial finds Luna too. It is all down to Ysera, throws the C4, but by the oh. time it lands, he's been sent out of here. Really good round coming out of Cloud9. Giants just lacking any real focus towards the north side. They did have a couple playing in sight, but you saw them slowly getting picked off piece after piece. And what I thought would be the big problem for Cloud9 there was Freezer. You need to hold the north door, or at least have no one playing inside of Freezer from the defensive side. Because once you try and plant in the northeast corner inside of Supply, it is a very easy sightline from that doorway straight into the planter, and you can deny it from there. However, kill after kill after kill swung the way of C9. Nothing coming back their way, even dealing with hysterics in rapid and excellent fashion. Giants had nothing in that round, literally nothing. Well, they're going to try it again. The laundry is the double down here. And obviously, with the pace that we saw Hysterics close down on, I think this is what you pointed out, is it was completely isolated, completely alone. It was a very easy job of use of utility. I talked about the Clash before. Those guys talked about the Monty, and here they are, one apiece, as we look towards potentially a slower and steadier round, hopefully, for the Giants, I'm assuming. But C9, again, if the first map was their introduction to this, that round was just... Chapter two in a in the book of pain. <laughs> the book of pain. <laughs> Keep that one in the bookshelf for some nightly <laughs> reminders. Or nightmares if you're one of the members of Giants, no doubt. Seeing this clash coming out here, that should be a hold inside of or around construction. We've seen a number of teams play clash and step outside with it. Trigger that warning of enemies outside the map. Yes, it's a clash staring down into construction, making sure no one is pushing in that direction. Pretty safe sat behind the shield in that case. Matching up against the Monty, I find this duel that we're starting to see a lot of teams employ. I remember first seeing it between Na'Vi and G2 on Cafe. The counter by Na'Vi was to bring the Clash, play it in White Corridor to counter the Monty as they tried to force their way down. So a lot of teams have now started employing that as the go-to get the hell back. You have a smoke on side at the same time. So there's a lot of tools to slow down Cloud9 here in what is already no doubt going to be a pretty slow push given there's a Monty on side. Looks like they're putting more pressure towards the blue side in terms, as you said, rolling behind that Monty. They saw that this wasn't watched as hyper-aggressively, and they also saw that they were quite able to just get all the way up to the blue bunker wall. It was previously double reinforced. They didn't have anybody playing on the rotation. Whether it was done slightly later in the round or not, I didn't quite see. But by the time they got there to put the destruction down, it was free real estate. And I think they were hoping and trying to capitalize upon that. But look at the change in Giants' defense. They've got more aggressive. They've left it half soft. They have the ability to rotate into the bunker. And they also have the Clash playing on those tower stairs. Just shy and just above of Happy Potter, but... Just got reinforced. Just got reinforced. Cool. So a good plan because you have your Clash stepping in and out of it. It means Monty can also walk through. So making sure you've got that blocked off. Absolutely the play. Going to commit one of their Xkairos towards the north here, I think, to get Electric Wall opened up. In fact, no, it was the hatch above, my bad. So they have the vertical control they've been looking for. They have the Monty downstairs. They have two or three, bless you, Fluke. A couple more pushing on the downstairs still. So they're in a spot of control, the same as in the last round, but the clash is the big deal here. Luna playing inside a boiler. Should be able to waste some time as long as he doesn't concede too much room. This wall, unfortunately, my friend, is muted, and you also have an Electric Claw standing. Yeah, Electric Claw's just waiting. There's the Thatcher. That's slightly rotten oh, timing. timing. And that gets it all. And Ysera, you're going to try something bold. The Mute Jammer's too late. Cannot trick that, I'm afraid. And they well. did that on purpose. They pre-planted that in the expectation the Electric Claw will come out to destroy it. And then just waited. So, okay, we've heard the Electric Claw. Roll me down one of them EMPs, big boy. And get rid of those ga those gadgets on the wall. Beautiful play. Ysera gone. The Kaid removed. Envy Taylor, what a thunder of a game he's having so far. Jordan also bringing one back against him, mind you, to balance things out at four versus four. The utility usage has been pitch perfect from the hands of Cloud9 so far. And again, the weight, the hesitation to bait that kind of play works really well. But here is the aggression from Giants. What we talked about with the Clash before and what she can offer a team that can move and manipulate the play space behind her. It's actually Monty that's going to try and go deep, but Speakeasy is there to make sure that they cannot enjoy themselves in this laundry site. The Diffuse is cold and right in the eyes, locked in front of a Clash. She can just play against that as much as she wants. She sees both bodies are left on Pillar. There's the pop, there's another pop, and there's a death. Wow. Yeah, taken by Jordan, and Giants take the round. Better. Did a good job of being able to push back, and the clash, as we mentioned, was a big part of that. Just holding around Boiler, even pushing as far up against Blue Bunker as possible to not concede control of that north wall. 
And that was meant to be the intent, I think, for the Thermite. Was the same as in the last round. Get supply open, rotate round into boiler room, and get that north wall open to then complete the, I suppose, the openings required to try and go for a plant in that northeast corner. However, after biting back, we're going to change sites. Kitchen and dining, where we're going to next, and not going towards kids, where most teams will opt to go through as their second site. Giants are saying, you know what, kitchen dining, we're hungry. We're hungry for some more rounds here if we're going to be able to bring Oregon our way. So that shall be the site choice. What do you hope they're cooking up in this kitchen? Uh, is there some win-related uh, dish you can think of? Wings? That was terrible. You cannot eat wind. Wings. Please. Oh, wings. No, I thought you just said wind. Yes, eat wind. It's the new fad diet that everyone's on. Not me. The winds of change, <laughs> maybe? I have eaten like a... Mo you know when in Paris? Yes. Do as Parisians do. Eat what delicious have you been doing? food. <laughs> Eating delicious food. Too much food. It's been glorious. Hey, a shower extension. You didn't want to call things... Shock. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the standard. Now, it's the extension that you need to mm. do. It locks you with that kind of confidence. You sometimes see, obviously, a castle played here too. They've gone back with the clash, which is, for me, better for them. Because they can be this responsive aggression. They're really good at shooting people when they need to. Really, really good at it. But they just, again, for me, what was lackluster in the first map was that confidence. Was that cutting edge that we know that they're capable of, especially players, obviously, like Hysterics, here now with a clash like kind of in front of them and behind their team and behind what they can do with it. I like that they're being a bit more freewheeling and a bit more counter-aggressive. Was the adaptation coming out from me as well is that in the first round we saw Hysterics try to play this aggressive drone game, immediately shut down and thought, right, no more of that. We play things a little bit more safer, a little more controlled here, a little more closer to home. You have got the Echo playing on the upstairs. It was Sarah a second ago. I'm not sure if he was just putting down a Yokai drone up there or if his intent is actually to stay on the upstairs. Looks like that's going to be the case, supporting the clash up here of Luna. Very common to do this because otherwise the kitchen is left completely bare to the attackers from above. They can hold the critical angles. And unless you can contest them at long range from inside of dining, you're out of luck. They're going to be able to plant inside of the kitchen and get themselves back upstairs and just sit there with three or four members on the top floor, very happily watching that diffuser. So a smart call to defend up here from Giants. Well, they spotted the clash out, and we've seen a clash and one other body do amazing clutches up on the second story before. The other person they have to help is Hysteria. If you want somebody, well, they're probably top of a lot of teams around the world's list. Now it's just a droning game. C9 seeing if they can get as much of an idea of how they want to take care of the clash inside the bedroom and dorms as much as possible. But with a misfired pop, it's not going to start the way they want to. There's some more misfire as they look and very closely find themselves getting a pretty sharp haircut from the gun buried in the dorms. But as the pressure now comes from the split site and attic as well, things are getting very dicey for them. They know they're sat near the back of this side, so opening up is the right call. As long as the Jaeger stays alive and doesn't expose himself, then it should be not be a problem. Not the Jaeger, sorry, the Echo. Ysera goes, yep, I agree. It's time to drop away and keep myself alive, and has done just that. Hysteric snaking his way around through meeting in case there is a drop or a push that comes in through the green corridor. Right now, all the focus is still on the top floor because this clash still being present. Luna can drop here, and they've wasted two minutes. That is a lot of time to have burnt out of the defend out of the attacking side, and this is where mistakes will start to get made by Cloud9 because of the limitation on time left to actually execute their plan. Yeah, I guess it's the dedication to we want to do this and Giants going, well, we're actually just going to go somewhere else now. Here is the potential of a great pinch, but oh. there is the potential of a huge mistake. Hysterics with a quick double, and oh no, it's just a little thing called all of your hard destruction. 5-2 as Speakeasy finds one on the opposite side, and the site is now completely abandoned in terms of what they can do with it. They've just got to try and find the frags to pull themselves through very tight doorways. Yeah, and this 5 versus 2 against a clash of all people, and you still got the Evil Eyes and the Yokais and the Smokes to contest inside 10 seconds. This is one of those rounds that we don't see going any other way. Peeks out, Envy almost finding one, not quite landing the shots to find the kill. And here comes Hysterics with the triple kill, swinging out from Split in assistance with the clash. Only one left to Live as MB by himself. He is but a man. Giants take round number three in pretty convincing fashion. And part of that admittedly came down to quite a bit of misdroning coming out of the side of C9. Yeah, I mean, I guess for all the compliments I've given them about their utility there, they just dedicated too much. They were too focused on the utility burn against a portion of what could be done. And obviously, Hysterics proved that, yeah, sure, you've got all the intel on these two bodies that are playing around dorms and kids' dorms. You know where they are. That's great. 
but they have all of these escape routes and they just had to take one of the many options available to them and then it turned into everything falling apart from C9 because at that point you've wasted a lot of your drones you've already used your Zafia stuns by the looks of it too and now you've only got about 30 seconds left you had to try and charge them through but the miscommunication that the drone whether picked up where Hysterics was in meeting or not allowed him to head back round to split and then cut the head off of two very unsuspecting hard destructions. It tells you a lot when Hysterics can rotate from playing white stairs at the start of the round, get down past security corridor, up through Zulu, and then across in towards split and eventually meeting. There just wasn't a lot of focus from Cloud9 on the right areas of the map. They were very fixated on dealing with this clash and the Echo playing on the top floor, thinking, well, if we are going to execute on the site, we need to get rid of them. But it's almost like you skipped a few steps in the construction of something or other, a step list, whatever you've got. They skipped to step three or four and ignored the fact that Asterix, as we all know, likes to play these more aggressive positions. Yes, back in round two, he dialed it back in. They played on site because they were playing in the basement. But as you saw in this round, with it being on the top, on the ground floor, sorry, you can make use of all three floors if you want to as part of your defense. And then that replay you saw there, catching both of the hard breaches, charging in through main lobby, past split, without a single drone watching, not just split, but meeting itself. You can see why that stung so hard on why it shut down all prospects of winning the round. See, that's one of the questions I have, though, because we saw a drone go down inside meeting just before that occurred. Less than five seconds, I would say, between him charging <laughs> towards that firefight and between the drone going down. So I'm just wondering what they expected from Hysterics, because, well, when you're looking at the 30 seconds, whether you expect them to head one way or not, you've still got to be aware of the presence. Mm. And I guess, you know, maybe it stands out because otherwise Cloud9 have been exceptional at this so far throughout the day. They seem to be well aware and well in control of the location. Ooh. But here, little moments like this, they turned away to look to the default and they almost caught the body, but Hysterics is free to live, free to fight another day, and no damage landed on either of them. So I guess that's that shows you how much of a surprise it was. It was cheeky. And Hysterics is still lurking here, doesn't want to pull himself away, doesn't want to avoid a gunfight, wants to get himself more than invested. And Luna going down on the Echo. We spoke about this yesterday. Oh. The power spikes, echo, late round. You want those yokais now? They are nothing more than invisible cameras stuck and clinging to the ceiling. They should be emitting no sonic blast to interrupt any plants or disorientate any of the attackers. We spoke about Luna and his kind of propensity for dying early in rounds as the entry. He had the highest number of entry deaths in the open in the main season for the side of Giants. No doubt something else that needs to be worked on going into next season. Walking seems to be their next angle of entrance, and, well, it's being heavily watched. They've obviously still got to apply the pressure towards Laundry as well, and they're looking to put some onto Kidstorm's windows. It's a myriad of pressure that they want to apply across the face of this site, and Nova's going to capitalize. Jordan goes down, puts them into the five versus three, and more utility is going to be popped and burnt towards this man still dug in on Attic. Hysterics is underneath waiting for a big possibility of a roam in a close down, but with a minute on and you can see the activity of the drones still around Kitchen, still around the first floor, they well, aren't we'll letting him down. slip away just yet. They're not making the same mistakes and, ah. well, that's how they capitalize. Sweet Black held the roam uh, and held it for as long as possible. Probably the longest the Nash has ever held the roam. But against Hysterics, you can't be too careful. Is there and Speakeasy mined one apiece and put some semblance of hope back into the hands of this, but with the utility again stopping and stemming this flow into the site, so things are starting to look a little bit shaky for Cloud9. Nova's probably spent the last 90 seconds or so running around outside, getting up on the rappel, coming back down again. Hasn't really had an impact here. And the loss of that window now means that C9 are in a spot where they can finally go for a plant. They've got themselves inside of the site, but it's the fact that it's a two versus two. You're against the C4. They can use it if they want to. They don't even need to. They don't even know where Giants are. And Giants take the round away despite it looking so good for Cloud9 for the majority of it. One of the things I think I'm seeing here is they're putting a lot of potential in terms of closing a specific part of the room, closing a specific part of the shutdown. So obviously the round before, we were seeing it on the dorms hold with the clash and hysterics. Here, oh, we're doing it again with hysterics. Yes, you get the kill, but twice in a row, we've seen that lack of drones, that lack of utility when it actually comes to capitalizing upon it and capitalizing upon the site completely cost them. Mm. They have no idea where anybody seems to be inside the site and things just aren't quite clicking as consistently as it was last time. Downstairs we head, supply and laundry. We return down here, the site that we saw Cloud9 win back in round number one. Since then, haven't found anything. Three rounds have gone the way of the Giants. And down here, it came a lot to the clash. The delay tactics being employed were massive for them. 
Giants in this round opting and saying, you know, we don't care, let's not bring the Clash. There is no Monty coming through from the side of Cloud9. So it's back to what we saw in round one, and that somewhat concerns me given how it worked out for them last time. But I spoke to Gig during the break, he did just say, you know, just kind of getting started, we are warming into it a little bit, didn't play how we normally would, we'll fix it for the next map. And so far, given how Asterix has played in the row, yes, being shut down once, they have looked a lot better. And Cloud9 are the ones here who are lacking on that utility piece, the ones that are lacking on the droning side of things, losing key members in opportunities that they shouldn't be, or just taking gunfights at times when it feels like there's no need, or they just don't have the information to feed that gunfight. So let's see if in this round it can be a bit more composed. Downstairs generally is a little bit easier to attack. There is no soft flooring above. It's all just hatches, and then the actual horizontal attacks you can bring in from things like construction or from Big Tower if you do want to start on the top floor. Charles got upstairs very, very quickly. I believe that was the smoke holding nearby. So got to be cautious of that. Nice KE placement. Electro Claw goes wide enough to be able to obviously get the wall and the hatch, and they're going to pull back ground. Oh, it doesn't get the wall, just the hatch, but the hatch yeah. is. It's because you can't then like burn it out if you bring a Maverick up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it becomes much tougher Kali. to get rid of, and obviously with uh, yeah the slight limitations that they're playing with. That is on the board, it's true, but you know it, it plays against particular styles. One of the things I think is worth kind of looking at as well is if we're going to talk about hysterics, sure he hasn't had the biggest frag impact, but the time impact that he's been able to have on this map, which he could not manage to get working for him on a big map like Villa, maybe it's something about the hectic nature that Oregon can offer. Maybe it's something about the synergy that you have in terms of the rotation, how quickly you can dart between very core points of a map that offers these great routes through. Either way, he's not finding as many kills as expected. It's weird to say a 1KD is like, eh, that's an okay day. But in the same breath, the amount of minutes, the amount of time that he's taken and utility and drones to is the big this. play here. Will he catch it? Oh, no. Double down. And, yeah, that is Electro open. That was close as well, because that could have destroyed it just in the nick of time if they weren't careful, and that wouldn't have been uh, the most ideal or effective use of an Kairos. You don't just throw these things into electrics for the fun of it. It's more down to excellent denial from the defensive side. He had a Sterex, or is still playing inside a Freezer at this point. I think they're expecting a rotation to come through, where often you'll see a Habana get that opened up inside a meeting, then move down to security, get that one opened up so they can contest inside a Freezer. It stops the Sterex being able to play the kind of angle that he is right now, where he's sat quite deep inside a Freezer and able to extend, if he so chooses, up towards White Stairs. This north wall, not being reinforced this time, gets opened up by the Zofia, and you can hear yet another wall getting opened up here behind them by the sounds of it. So, a lot of the work being done by Cloud9, the setup is done, everything is ready. It all comes down to the execute. And here comes the pop of utility, and here comes Sia looking for Luna, who so far hasn't been able to find a single body. Still is obviously alive, but for how much longer you think in the position that they're in? There is the pressure that can come from long, and there's only 30 seconds for them to do it. They haven't been able to get blue open, and there's a C4 from deep, sweet black is out of here. Envy Taylor goes for the rotation, but it's still closed off, and it's going to be a long run to find nothing that is useful. Now, they have to try to apply all of the pressure that they can from what they've got open. It's not a huge selection. It's not a huge amount. But, well, that is a kill you really should get, Nova. Falls to Speakeasy. Harper finds one in return. But with all the bodies falling on the opening of the door, this seems like it's going to swing into the favor, and it does, mm. of Giants. Hmm. That was one of those where they couldn't get supply open this time. It stayed closed, it was muted up the whole time, which meant that Luna could sit where he was just a second ago against that wall and say, well, you want to push against me? I'm ready, I'm waiting, I'm watching the angle. Dare you even try? And although they managed to deal with Hysterics playing inside a freezer, that was that critical angle we spoke about earlier on, needing to keep that held down in case the plant does come through into the northeast corner. But I think without that supply wall open, you just give too much room to the defenders. They can have that east side of supply and look to contest you, whether that's with C4s, whether it's with guns looking in towards the hallway. Just a bit too comfortable for the side of Giants, and it looks like almost a reverse story of last time, Fluke. It's 4-1 to the side of Giants, potentially 5-1. This is what we saw on Villa. Yep, literally the replication, and I guess it's one of the ways of, well, confidence. Confidence is key, and that mentality is definitely working in the favor of Giants right now. They are more comfortable on this Oregon. Maybe it's because they are more familiar of what to expect from the hands of Cloud9, and maybe it's just things are clicking with them slightly better than they were before. Either way, definitely a great split. Can they make it a fantastic one as they look towards trying to hold the dining kitchen area, seeing if they can lock down one more site, one more play. There's a compliment to Cloud9. You wanted the real arm wrestle for them. Well, unfortunately, we don't have that, but we do have just guns. 
if we're doing this in the form of an arm wrestle, it's kind of swinging down like yeah. Giants are feeling fatigue, right? They woke up, they're not quite done the warm ups required. Now they're getting back into it. And at four on one, it's looking like it might be more balance coming into the end of the second map, in which case it basically resets and becomes a best of three all over again. Very aggressive wait here. Pepper's bullets in the same breath, and it's just going to go for the swing. IQ seems aware. And Sweet Black is going to survive, but so is Hysterics. Here's the armory window being broken open too. They know that their time here is very limited and they're not going to push their luck too much. Has the rotation around the dorm space as well, but here comes the drones and here comes what I've been complimenting Hysterics on so well so far. Wasting time, baiting the play and baiting the control. The hatch is open and Sarah's upstairs this time too. Mm. It just slows everything down, right? Once you know that there is a Jaeger willing to contest you at the doorway entry into the building, you're like, great. Pull back, get drones out, make sure we know where he is. We need to track him, force him back to sight, apply a pinch setup. You can easily lose 45 seconds trying to clear a Roma who is playing that aggressively. Of, cro of course, then the risk on the side of hysterics becomes, well, if I get picked off early here, we've given them a massive opening into this round where they haven't got to worry about the Romas. You are right, though. Once more, it is the two playing upstairs. You've got the Yokai's of Ysera. You then also got Luna playing up here on the Clash. Hysterics, I believe, ran back down towards White Stairs and has now pedaled back even further down the stairs towards the site as he was previously. If you remember, he was in meeting, causing trouble, and I just saw him flash down towards Security Corridor a second ago. He's doing Hysterics things. He's having the run of the mill right now. This is his playground. And Cloud9 are the new kids on the block that is like, no, those are my space hoppers. As he looks to space to see if anything can come to fruition above. Unfortunately, he sees nothing but a night sky. Nobody has drifted close enough to the guns from beneath as they still battle and look towards the Clash. They've got a very wide banner angle open here. And, well, Clash is just going to disco dance either side and has the hatch to escape if need be. There's no intense pressure for her from this moment in time. They can try and bait and use and utilize utility, but in the same breath, Clash just has to time it well. Have the shield angled, have yourself hot drop down below, and yeah, sure, you've handed over the top, but yet again, we're passing to this minute, and yet again, well, things aren't going so great, I say, as Harper does a beastly pick against Speakeasy. Your player hasn't been able to show up so much, Harper. Well, it showed up in the beginning of this round, and Nova is going to double down, takes care of Isera. The health bars on the side of C9, you can see that those trades aren't exactly one-sided. They are quite close, but ultimately it's bodies on the ground that really count here in Siege. And one more hits the deck. Sweet Black taken down as Giants even things out with two more kills. Hysterics once again is striking big, this time inside a meeting rather than in split. will finally get traded out. And Cloud9, Harper in particular, picking up Jordan as the last man standing, will take round number six and put it up at four and two at the split. Okay, some semblance of control is back in the clouds and well it's just seeing if the giants can reach it and pull it back down to their level as we go over to the attacking half this was one of the big problems we saw from them last time around was that lack of pace that lack of passion when they were trying to capitalize and close down on the defenders it seemed like they were missing the intensity that cloud nine wanted to bring to this day and the intensity we know they're capable of bringing but in the same way this is a much better half from them the best that they've played today can they continue it? Can they translate it over to their attacks and go, we know what we're doing now. We know the game that we play. Let's just go out there and play it. Mirror for the top floor. Hmm. Not even six picked out. It's going to be the Kai again is swapped out. They are trying to bait the downstairs setup with this selection and saying, OK, you'll see in the mirror. We're going to head down there. No. Kaid also suggests we're heading downstairs. No, we are on the top floor. This could well turn out to be a horizontal hall. We've seen this come through a couple of times where you set up downstairs inside a kitchen. And given that's where Sweet Black is currently headed, that does seem to be the plan. More commonly, you'd see something like a mute being brought along here to deny any of the intel on what on earth is going on inside of the kitchen. They could be cooking up a storm, they could be cooking up anything, but normally you wouldn't know. Castle can be brought along too, but neither of those operators are present. So I'm excited to see how they play this with the mirror. I imagine the C4 is going to be a big piece of this. That's normally the denial that you play behind. Perhaps most notably is the fact that with the Goyo band, though, C9 are opting to bring three shields along with only the one C4. Now, as you said, the mirror on the second story is always a point of curiosity. It's a very powerful operator. It expands sights and sight lines and allows you to play some pretty tricky situations very well. Our man Demo had a very good description for mirror. Makes the undefendable sights defendable and makes defendable sights fortresses or impenetrable. That's a very good saying, and unfortunately, that's not a very good entry. See you, <laughs> no. Jordan. You're off the board. Half is there. It's got, like, dunked on by three people. Crossfires coming from every which angle. Yeah, that was one of those, like, 
pause it here, and uh, this is the moment <laughs> I knew I'd messed up. There's at least the response in the hands uh, of Hysterics, again, a player who, you know, when they're showing up, they can be beastly. They've shown up better on this map than they did on the first, and I feel like if they start to get more of, oh, a little old thing called being a plus 54 entry KD, or KD for in general, with a huge entry too, you know, that is a big point of worry for Cloud9. As I mentioned before, it's not just on the defense that he does trouble either, that he's trying to be that instigator on the roam, the one trying to get against doorways and say no entry. I'm the bouncer for Oregon and you are not allowed inside. You're not wearing the right garbs. In this case, on the attack on the Ash instead, it's more about trying to be the one inside the building early and catching those out. Here, it was the isolation that came against Shile afterwards that really came back to sting. So, Hysterics doling back the punishment as to what C9 did to him back in the first half when he was the one trying to be aggressive. There's the pings, there's the pressure, and well, if they're not being let in, there's the giant saying, do you know who I am? As they try and force them back off the top of Attic and force them away from the close window, here comes Walk-In, and there it goes and blows. It doesn't seem anyone immediately able to counter it. Speakeasy's going for the rotation, but Harper could strike big here. Ooh, actually drops down for the rotation. Knew they were being pinched and pincered, and ain't gonna play that game as they head back round slowly up Freezer stairs to see if they can take this Ash by surprise. This is normally where I'd love a mute because you won't have any idea who is inside of security, so you have to push him blind. Harper's up behind, they could be like, hey, pushing in. Hey, I'm behind you, buddy, what's happened? Dropping through the hatch, smart idea, but no one is going to push in towards security. Seems like they're not too bothered about what's going on downstairs. I mentioned about the fact there is no mute means that the drones can get inside. They can know who's holding, and once it is abandoned, well, there is no reason to push it anymore. They surely know one or two are downstairs in hysterics. Four in the cross angle, but the Ella challenges, wins it out. That's two kills coming out from Harper. He instantly is traded. This is happening time and time again between these two teams. Just one team gets a kill, the other one is there to answer straight away. It is Trade City here, please. Luke. Well, with the man lying down, he gets picked up by Sarah. looks for the second, but can't quite find it. They're rotating and dancing, and the canister's going to force the dance to end. A little bit earlier than they hoped. With only 10 seconds, though, you've still got to find your way in to get the diffuser down, you Sarah. and they're going to try and plant it in all the audio bugs and bangs that are going on around them. There's a bad trade in their hands. They've swapped to the shotgun, and he's Disco oh -ho -ho! dancing on the floor, but Cloud9 take one more. Bit of a break dance coming out of the Thermite at the bitter end to win the final trade, but, well, not the final, the penultimate trade. The final one was, of course, never to happen as it ended in a one-to-one. -one. Cloud9 being on the defensive side closed, closed things out to the timer. So I like how much time they were wasting playing on the downstairs. It did draw a lot of attention and ire almost from the side of Giants. Clearly irritated by the fact that this hold could always be re-employed later on by Cloud9 if required. Wanted to make sure that they dealt with the Ella, but Hysterics unfortunately not able to land those critical shots out towards Iron Armory stairs, but they had even more problems to deal with going into the closing seconds. We're going to see them do the same thing as they did back on Villa. Rather than Luna being the one bringing along the Ying, it's going to be Jordan operating, opting to play that instead, sorry. So I think this is probably more down to what it is that they want uh, Luna playing here, playing on that Thatcher. I hate to harp on the guy, but it's stacking up once again that he's not having the best game so far. Heading down beneath, heading to Laundry, as you said. A site we've seen go back and forth pretty continually throughout this entire tournament um, and across all the APAC tournaments. But here, so far, it's, you know, it's generally favored towards uh, Giants as of yet, 2-1. But obviously, the first time we're seeing them try and push it and try and take it. We've seen a different show a couple of times. We've seen a huge amount of aggression. We've seen a huge amount of pace. We've also seen the slow and steady approach. We've seen Clash try and get in and upside the faces of all the opponents, and, well, they're going to do that again. The worry when I see Candela's now in the showdown is are we going to see them misthrown and misrolled as before on Villa? She didn't have the greatest outing before. If I remember specifically, Luna was the one throwing them at his teammates rather than into the site. Yeah, and then the second one went behind, and then the third didn't go far enough. And unfortunately, neither does our look into this round as we pull ourselves. Unfortunately, and it's Cloud9 on the defensive side for the map that, as we alluded to the other day, is the most defender sided in APAC North. We've kind of been talking around this during South Asia, during Oceania, around how coastline only a 32% win rate for defenders on the rounds. 
Oregon has been about 60 to 62 percent. I can't remember the exact number, but it has been very defender leaning. Cloud9, no doubt, happy to be in the spot they're in. Envy Taylor going across to the vigil is one I am very keen to see how he tries to play this Jack out. To does he go for the same style as what Asterix does and looks to cause some trouble at windows and doorways? Or is his focus more on the the late round impact, the one who strikes late into the round and brings down a couple of crucial operators, or does he risk losing his life earlier on by trying to go for opening kills? They're opting to keep the sights hot, C9 obviously, which is part of the play of motion. And it's one of the things that I complimented, obviously, Hysterics on before, but Emmy Taylor is going to play that same game. Waste as much time, keep the map guessing, keep every ground slightly lava-esque in that nowhere is really safe for Giants. They're looking for safety and they can't seem to get it because, as we've seen, they haven't shown up with the sharpness we know that they're capable of as of yet. But it's early doors, two defensive rounds in a row. Obviously, we don't know how close the one that just happened off camera was. Either way, to go from a 4-1 to a 4-4, it's not great in anyone's mindset. Uh, three rounds on the swing, as mentioned, to Cloud9. Although it's that kind of split across halves, and we always say there are two halves to a game of Siege, teams can be very different on attack and on defense compared to what you may expect. It's why we've seen so many wonderful games go from like a 5-1 up to a 6-6. Six, six. Looks like Envy Taylor's answer to my earlier question is, I want to be in the opening kills. 30 seconds in, a window's being smashed open in Big Tower and trying to find the member playing out near construction, but they're a little bit too wise to his antics. You would imagine so for Giants, given how Hysterics likes to play, that the boys are pretty considerate of how other teams can play a similar style. Here, looking on towards the top floor, we are in the meeting site, by the way, so not dining in kitchen. It is one of the things I love about this map is that all four sites are viable. Meeting, generally, you won't try and defend from above. You'll often just play downstairs. You'll reinforce the hatch inside of Adam. Interestingly, out of the side of Cloud9, they've left it soft. And Sweet Bat looking almost soft on the ground, a limp corpse, but staying alive with just 20 HP remaining. Jordan taking quite a bit of damage as well. Soft walls are becoming a bit of a danger here as Sweet Black's just going to try and creep their way across. Has the C4 in pocket, but unfortunately the attempt at a peppering doesn't go their way. Jordan able to aim slightly further down. That MPX isn't great in terms of damage and is even worse when you've already fired yourself through a soft wall. Now then, that's the opener in their favor. That's a C4 off the board, and that is also Sweet Black, a player who hadn't had the best season, but definitely started to kick it into gear as time went on. Here again, has found more comfort, found more stability and capabilities. The floor is becoming very dangerous now. They have the verticality, they still have C4s, and they're looking to try and tear the first. Way. Dropped by Harper. Too easy. I love the vertical play that you get on this side. Shotguns all turn skyward. C4s heading up above as well. Makes things very uncomfortable for the side of Giants. Four versus four. It's not the end of the world, and I believe they are now out of C4. So Sweet Black going down early. That would have been his off the table. Indeed, they are. No one else alive, of course, to be able to use C4 in that case. As the three operators that you're also seeing on side are not able to wield them unless they'd be a little bit too strong. Ysera's now got his way inside of dining, opening up the west side, but peeks out onto Charles, who's holding inside of the green corridor. A bit too easy a kill there. Ysera a bit brave, a bit too optimistic in the angle that he wanted to hold. Luna is going to assume the same position. And this is looking another one of those rounds, Fluke. It looks like Cloud9 are the ones in full control, but you've got to be so wary of these vertical angles that you've still got the side of Giants trying to utilize. They've finally dropped down both members on the ground floor. Charles from the same spot again. Luna surely had the call that he was playing on the doorway. All too easy for Cloud9 as yet another round swings their way. They are now in the lead for the first time on this map. Five and four. And my word, even I didn't anticipate this would start off as a 2-0 to Cloud9 if this goes the same, if this carries on the same way it has done and takes us into map number three. Yeah, obviously Club is next on the chopping board. Club is next up and Club is a map where Hey, it's old familiar for a lot of these teams, but as I know you have a big old book of statistics, you could probably give an idea. However, what I will say is this game has been throw the book out the window. Apparently nothing matters. It's all just playing this game, playing today because C9 have shown up in bits. Everything has been so consistent. They've looked better and better in some rounds and slightly less, but otherwise still very, very good. They're not making similar mistakes they made throughout the season. Everything is just well played across the board. I'll say the same thing about Cloud9 today that I said about them during their game with Cyclops, is they just look 
sharper in both positive and negative ways. That they have kind of larger swings. I mentioned Sweet Black and his minus 21 KD during the regular season. You look towards Shile, he was on plus 33. So between them all, there is a very a big difference. In fact, I'm a liar. I believe it was 23, not 33. What am I talking about? Their entry stats were also incredible. Gosh, you had Envy Taylor and Shile being like plus eight and plus seven. Yeah. The only one on the other side to really match that was Hysterix, who we've spoken about quite a bit already. He was on plus seven, heavily balanced out by the fact that Luna was five and 17, giving the team an overall net average, I think, of about minus three. So although Cloud9 have this sharpness and they don't have the same highs that someone like Hysterix has, their entry stats are always prolific. And as you said in the last map, I believe, it was Giants who were losing most of those entries fights. Yeah, and that's it. And obviously they take the first there. Jordan gets sweet black, but then from then on, things just start to shut down. C9. They seem much more apt uh, when they lose this opening momentum, still finding something out of it, still finding the trades, the pickups. They have each other's back and they have it very, very well. And that doesn't seem to be a problem that Giants have a solution to just yet. Try to swing my chair around. That's all right. Plant down another way. There we go. <laughs> I was sat in the same position I had to very rapidly sit down the desk in for the whole of those few rounds. And I was like, okay, my left leg is now starting to ache. Oh. However, here we go. Shile doing a hysteric special, we'll call it. Sad the double doors, daring someone to walk in. But as I keep on saying, these trades are ever present in this series between the two teams. Someone makes a nice play. There is always someone waiting to pinch as they pull back for the rotation towards safety. Now, as Envy Taylor's dug in close and waiting for anyone to get... Well, even closer, Giants are going to opt for a little game of In-N-Out. It's actually just going to pull away, Envy Taylor. I think they heard how many footsteps were close, realized they're probably not going to be able to hold down the fort as much as they can, so go to the structure that the other side of Attic offers. Dig in behind the wall for the pig and see what else you can pull off out of there. There's the explosion, there's the pressure Envy Taylor expected, and there's the jettison out towards Dorms. They have themselves more solid. Unfortunately, we do not. Oh. Third uh, time unlucky, I guess. Third time unlucky. He's very fluffy. No, as fluffy as your dog, actually. It's like I said yesterday, he's Kato plus colors. Yep. Hey, laundry and supply on a 6-4. And, and a Monty. Monty. Me, Jinx. Does that mean I'm not allowed to speak now? Because that's going <laughs> to... You can't say Monty. Sucks for you on the broadcast <laughs> by yourself. <laughs> Have fun with that one. It is what we saw back at the very start of the match, actually, in round number two, when Giants brought along the Clash to respond to Amonti being brought out by the side of Cloud9. That was in round two, and the first round was the flawless one that went the way of Cloud9. No doubt dreaming of the same once again to put them up at two and zero. There will be a lot of breathing room in the Cloud9 camp if they can get away with it. Let's see how the defense comes out from them, because if you recall, we saw Giants flip-flop in between playing with Amira, playing with the Clash. C9 are doubling down and saying, we want to play with both. Giants are going to gamble again on the Ying. I want to see a Candela insight. We have missed so many. You want to see it work. And you also look at the fact that there's obviously four smokes there alongside the Monty. You think maybe they're going to play this play where they... Sorry, Fed is all over the wall behind. Oh. Uh, with the Finca, whether they're just going to try and charge in alongside some smokes, get the plant in whilst Ying causes some damage with the Finca on the opposite side, draw some attention away from what they want to do with the plant itself or not. I guess it's one of those questions and one of those points where you think, how is this going to go? There's quite a lot riding on both sides. Envy Taylor and Sweet Black being on the mirror and the Clash just screams, we want to hold you back, we want to cause some trouble. Clash sometimes described as the mobile mirror. On the side of Giants, everything is about this execute with the Ying, with the Finca, with the Monty. It just screams that they want to get inside of sight and cause some trouble. Whether or not they're given that allowance depends entirely on what Charles can achieve on the Rome at the top of tower right now, pulling his way back down towards sight. If he'd found an opening kill onto any of those three crucial operators, this round would have been thrown into disarray for the Giants. Looking to apply some pressure from the top now as they obviously look at try and find the roam. Obviously, I said that too many times, they're frustrated by the roam game. That has otherwise been a consistent dick through the spokes of the cycle that, Cloud, uh, that Giants are trying to ride into sight. And, well, this time, not so much. Probably the first time we've actually seen all of the players close to the floor and close to the site itself. It is very well spread out, but Clash is surviving the first frag grenade. And at the cost of a couple of drones, by the looks of it, they died doing what they loved, droning. Died <laughs> doing what they loved. Oh, five drones already gone from the side of Giants. It has been a... 
of a journey, a magical ride for those drones, clearing out the top floor, heading down the, the tower stairs, as you saw a second ago. No doubt a couple caught in the blast radius of the frag that barely took any damage Very away nice. from Sweet Black. They're going for the split setup, and here comes the first Finker boost being pulled in. That plus 20 HP, the lower ADS time, does give you a great amount of favor coming into fights. But right now, no one really looking to push in, it seems. They're still holding around outside, and here we go. Shile swinging around from Boiler, going to bring down Ysera, who was playing behind the Monty. It's almost like he didn't exist, like he was a piece of paper. Gets it around the back of him. Now Luna trying to challenge onto the Ella here, going for the spray out. He who knows best, it is Luna. Plays his operator an awful lot, but can't quite win the fight. He's down to a slither of HP. Harper coming out better in this trade. And finally, we're going to see the Candela singing through, but it's also out of whack, I think, Flute. There's been a difference in when the Fink has been popped, when the Monty pushed forward, when the Candelas have come out. It just looks a little bit scrappy. Yeah, for me, the division that we're seeing between their season now has been a far cry from what they were able to achieve in the Giants' hand. Everything is it's like watching dog fights actually come together here, more akin to raving rabbits than anything more structured. And as they actually try and go in for this push, it's starting to fall apart. Everything is for honor here, and the spray comes down a three versus two as they just dance around each other towards blue. Very good, very good. As good as this round is setting up for the side of Cloud9. Two versus one. Luna has got a slither of HP, quite literally one HP on side, but has got to win two pistol gunfights. They must know where he is. Of course they do, and he clearly has no idea. Cloud9 taking the second map in this series, and this is shaping up to be one hell of an upset. Very rarely did we talk about Cloud9 during the main season. They didn't go on the kind of records that we saw coming out of Giants. Nine and one, Xavier six and zero. But here they're the ones about to take everything away. Only Clubhouse stands between them. 510 SA points, SI points, 25,600 dollars, and bragging rights of the region. Clubhouse.